LeeTDickey.com. Do you have an event or occasion coming up that could use a special touch? Perhaps a wedding, a production, a show? Good! Then you're in luck. Haley Moores is who you're looking for. Haley is a makeup artist in the Toronto, Ontario area, specializing in bridal, glam, natural, and special effects. She's incredibly talented, professional, easy to work with, and has a personality that is second to none. To book Haley Moores today, follow her on Instagram at mad underscore malash, that's M-A-D underscore M-I-L-A-S-H, or email her at madmalash, again, that's M-A-D-M-I-L-A-S-H, at gmail.com. Book Haley Moores today, you'll be glad you did. LeeTDickey.com LeeTDickey.com What's going on, everybody? Lee Dickey here. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. Today, as of recording, is January 10th, 2020, and it is 7 degrees Celsius here in Toronto, Canada, which basically means it's summer. Yes, this is the first leg of summer, I suppose. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Funny, funny, funny. Today, I present to you my interview with a special guest. I am joined this week by Mike Thibault, the Vice President and Co-Owner of Unigraph International. We get into what Unigraph is, a bit of the company history, how Mike got started with the company, and what it was like working for and under his father. Plus, we just have a good old-fashioned good time and a good conversation. So I hope you enjoy this week's episode. If you want to find out more about Unigraph International, please go to unigraphinternational.com. But now that you know a little bit about my guest, I want to tell you where you can find me, Lee Dickey, and the Beats and Speaks podcast. New episodes of the Beats and Speaks podcast go live every single Friday at midnight Eastern time on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, my official website, LeeTDickey.com. We're also on YouTube as well under Lee Dickey TV and wherever you get your podcast. So please do comment, like, share, and subscribe there as well if you'd like to leave us a review please do rate and leave us reviews on your favorite podcast app and player of choice because that helps us climb in the rankings which means we produce more content for you guys as i really enjoy producing and hosting this show if you'd like to be a guest on the beats and speaks podcast please do email me at leetdickey at gmail.com and we can set something up and go from there so you and i can have a good old-fashioned conversation like Mike Tebow and I did right here on the Beats and Speaks podcast. All information is in the description, but now that all the housekeeping is out of the way, let's get into my interview with the vice president and co-owner of Unigraph International, Mike Tebow. Hi, I'm Mike Tebow, vice president of technical services for Unigraph International, and you're listening to the Beats and Speaks podcast with Lee Dickey. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, and anyone else within earshot of the sound of my annoying voice, of course, this is another episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. I am your host, Lee Dickey, and we're making history right now, this week, today, on the Beats and Speaks podcast. I am joined by Mike Tebow, the co-owner and vice president of Unigraph International. Let's just jump right into this episode. Mike, thank you for joining me on the Beats and Speaks podcast this week. My pleasure, Lee. So... You're the co-owner and vice president of Unigraph International. Why don't you give us, give me a bit of the company history of Unigraph? Sure, sure. What we do at Unigraph International is we're a manufacturer of press room chemistry. Uh, We're third generation in the printing industry. Um, And basically what we do is we formulate all of our own products and then we sell to the end user through distribution channels. Uh, we've currently expanded into the U.S., and that provides our guys with a lot of traveling because we do a lot of technical support. Even though our dealers sell the product, we actually help the customer install the product on press. It's a fairly technical process, and uh, if we're not there to help them do that, our chances of success uh, go way, way, way down. So I've, I've, also, I've checked out some of Unigraph's website and the, a bit of a profile on you guys. What is it that... What goes into actually making a chemical? 
Um, it's like a recipe. It's really like a recipe. We have some of our specialty products that play a very important role in the printing process to end up with ink on paper that are anywhere from 15 to 20 ingredients. Uh, they're blended together in big blending tanks. So say if you want to get a, uh, an idea of capacity, picture a 55 gallon drum 36 times. Uh, some of the ingredients are crystals, liquids, powders. They have to be just like a recipe put together in a certain order, sometimes left to sit. And then there's what we call kick out. There's a little bit of separation. Then we recapture the good stuff and continue on with what we call the batch. And again, very important. It's just like a, a baking a cake. If you put things in in the wrong order, it ain't going to work. It's not going to rise and it's not going to taste good. So basically, you guys are a giant room full of like Bill Nye the Science Guy. Just, <laughs> just, just giant scientists in lab coats. I mean, what? That, that just sounds like so much fun. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that you guys travel a lot too. So how yes. much travel is involved? Um, for myself and the tech team, we are a total of six technicians on the road, plus the people at head office out of the South Shore of Montreal that manufacture. So they're local. Us guys on the road, we're on the road uh, maximum. We had to put a limit, but a maximum of two weeks a month. And that can bring us from Maine to California, from, you know, Newfoundland to Vancouver. But uh, definitely our expansion lately has been south of the border. And you're, you're moving south because the printing industry is, it's an eight or nine billion dollar industry here in Canada. Yeah. As you guys know, this show is produced out of Toronto, Canada, where Mike and I both live. So, of course, you're expanding down south because their population is 10 times larger and which means 10 yep. times more money. And it's, I mean, whatever it is here, multiply that by 10. And yep. is there a market within, say, the States that's sort of your, the big, the big seller or the big uh, client for you guys? Um, it, it really varies, Lee. Like throughout the States and each States, there's multiple what we would call big packaging printers, printers that do packaging for cosmetics, for feminine hygiene products, for food, for alcohol, beer cases. Those are massive plants. Those are plants that have three, four, five large format printing presses, offset printing presses, four, five, six hundred employees in the plant. And they'd be all, let's say, like corporately, like West Rock would have multiple plants across North America. Uh, paperworks, um, people like that, that would have locations throughout Canada, the U.S., and in some cases, Mexico and other countries. Getting back to how we started, um, you gave me a bit of a, the history on Unigraph. So how did you get involved? Um, I had the right last name. That, that works, too. <laughs> I, so I, I'm assuming, that was it a grandparent that started the business? Yeah, my grandfather started. It was in the printing industry, but it was a different product line. He actually uh, was quite the inventor for being a farmer. He got bored, and my grandfather was always good at machining things and thinking of different things. So he brought what we call the, the printing plate to the offset printing market, and he started his business in 1922. And uh, if you fast forward like everything else, now the materials that we use in an offset printing plate is aluminum. Back in the day, it was zinc. And he fashioned mis machines to put these rolls of zinc, cut them down, grain them, and make them uh, appropriate and acceptable for the printing process. That plate was sold worldwide. And uh, my father, my uncles, my aunts, a whole bunch of people, as it is, as you typical of a Quebec business, all, you know, were involved in the business. It's just a giant family yep. conglomerate. Yeah, yeah so it started from nothing. My grandfather working in the basement and then eventually having different offices and manufacturing plants in uh, throughout Quebec. And I believe it was in 1972. Um, commercial litho plate graining, the name of his company, they were bought out by Bemis Corporation out of the U.S. Mm. And at that point, uh, the Tebow family, not that I was, you know, at that age I wasn't involved, were no longer allowed to be a manufacturing printing place. But my, my, my grandfather always did is in the trade, he made friends with people who made the other consumables that are part of the printing process, the inks, the wash-up solutions, the chemistry and always had a hand in that. Actually, he was under license here in Canada to blend for some of those American chemical companies under their label. So, I mean, 
you mentioned having the right last name, and that helps too, but you see boys and girls, it's not what you know, <laughs> it's, it's who you know. know. <laughs> How did you uh, get involved? Uh, I tried really hard not to, mm -hmm. twice. Family business isn't always easy. Uh, my father was very difficult to work for, very difficult. You think that's because he expected so much of you? Uh, there's that, and you know what, it's not just that. I mean, in most, in any family business, there's really two scenarios that happen when the second generation comes up. Either the first generation, i.e. the owner-founder, mm -hmm. is more than happy to give up uh, a good part of, you know, the, the daily chores and the decision-making and the R&D and whatnot, and basically realizes that, you know, two or three people can do more than one person. Or there's... My dad's model, you know, hold on to everything with an iron fist. And in dad's case, two iron fists. And as much as he tried, and he really did try to delegate, it, it just, it wasn't in him. He was somebody who just like micromanage, oh, just sort of like, if he might be he'd be happy. <laughs> oh, it was that good, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I tried to leave the trade twice, but uh, my brother was there. He's local in on the South Shore of Montreal where where the plant is and uh, in those both occasions I came back and as we grew you know dad grew older and it just kind of happened by osmosis and then unfortunately in 2012 or 2011 he was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the end came in 2012 and you know we learned a lot from dad even though there were a lot of hard years but uh, I think he'd be proud of us today. We've uh, quadrupled the size of the company. We've uh, tripled the exposure of the company in the North American market. And everything my brother and I thought that we could do, we're managing to do. We're just older. We wish we could have done it younger, younger so we yeah. have more energy. But Why couldn't I do this in my 20s? Yeah, not in my mid to late 50s. Well, I mean, I'm sure he'd be proud. Why, yeah. like you guys have quadrupled the business. You're, you've got clients everywhere. Is there... Is there a certain, like, do you need a certain, say, je ne sais quoi to, like, get into the business that you are in, do you think? Definitely. Back in the day, if you were a good sales rep, you could pretty much sell anything and, and make a really good living. Our trade, like many trades, has become highly automated and very technical, very, very technical. So to give you an example, the last two hires that we did this year were both guys that they came right off of a printing press. They, they were pressmen by trade. They'd been doing it for 10, 20 years, whatever. And we looked and we looked long and hard for guys that were good pressmen. So they're good technically, good troubleshooters. But the, the hardest part, uh, because, and I, I don't mean to say this in a negative way at all, but it's a very blue collar trade. And you don't always find the guys that have the best people skills or best personality to deal with other people. They're great inside their environment, their four walls, but now you take them out and they have to deal with, you know, uh, an upset pressman or a plant manager or a VP of operations or they, even they an owner. They turn into a stranger in a strange land almost. Yeah. 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 So that's been our biggest challenge, but definitely the days of just going around with a price list and picking up orders, like in the 70s and 80s, that's... That those days are gone, yeah. gone, gone, gone. Well, I remember seeing Pez salesmen when I was a kid. Like, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> they, you can just buy Pez at the store. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Even, Do they even make Pez anymore? I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, if you're at Cracker Barrels south of the border, you'll find Pez. Yeah. But So, like you mentioned that your brother's in Montreal and you're here. How do you, how do you two manage the sort of the running of the business? Very good question. And we a couple of situations this year brought to light that we're not doing it as well as we should. Uh, my brother and I, we both do two very different things. We have both very different personalities. I head up the tech team, but I'm also the mouth of the South. I, I can go and get new customers, new dealers. John is at the manufacturing plant. He has to deal with the suppliers. He deals with the bank. He deals with formulation and he deals with production. Um, you know, he's more of a, a quieter introvert type of guy. I'm more of the outgoing guy. Um, and then with some difficult personnel issues that we've had to deal with, whatever, it, it made us realize that, you know, we need to be talking daily as partners, not just, well, you're doing your part of the business. I trust you. You're doing your part of the, and it works, mm -hmm. but you know, we've realized that we've really got to tighten up. And as more people are coming on board, it's important to have those daily talks. 
Well, I think that's the, I mean, and I'm a business owner myself. I, I run it. Thankfully, I'm my only employee. But uh, I can just, I can only imagine like, having to deal with like the geographical aspect of it, because obviously you're here in Toronto, your brother's in Montreal. It, so, but why don't you take me through, like, what's the day-to-day look like in your world? What is your day-to-day? Right. For me, it's planning. It's I, We have a CRM system that we uh, hired a company out of uh, Utah to, to, to work with. A lot of it was custom made programming, things that I absolutely wanted to have in that CRM. So we track every customer we have. We know the dealer that sells to that customer. We know the dealer rep within that customer. We have all their contacts, but more importantly is we tag all of their equipment. Every type of printing press known to mankind is in the database. And we assign those presses to that printer. We assign the consumables, ours and our, co- our competitors, to that printing press so we know the business that we have we know the business we need to go get and for us the biggest challenge and thank goodness i have a really good right hand man um, the calendar is what dictates uh, you know who goes where when is that going to happen we're almost at that point where we're not keeping up there's so much demand for the local dealer reps that motivate their customers to put our product on press we get the phone call or the email or the text, you know, you know, when is somebody available to go the week of January 6th, the week of January 13th, whatever. So that dictates, you know, where we're at. And then the second part to that is to do it as economically as possible. Flights are not cheap. Car rentals are not cheap. Well, no, and you were telling me, you know, off the air that you would probably spend this year alone probably about 120 nights away, right? So yeah. I, I can only imagine what it would cost to go from here to wherever yeah. 120 times a year. Yeah. That's because it's, it's time away from your family. It's time away from your own bed. And for anybody that travels for a living, which I can basically say that you do, because yeah. it's 120 nights a year, like, there's only so many times I want to, you know, be away from my own bed. I, exactly. And I'm finding, you know, I'm doing it because, well, if, if I don't do it, I can't expect my guys to do it. That's number one, but number two, you lead by example and you know, that's where the growth is. And my wife, Cheryl, she's awesome. I mean, you know, she's old school. She knows a man has to work to, to, to earn a living and build a business. And as we're getting a little older, I'll be 58 this year. We're maybe, and she's retired now trying to incorporate some of my business trips where she could tag along at the, or meet, sorry, not tag along, but meet me at the end of the trip. And spend that weekend, you know, if I happen to be doing work in Chicago mm. or in Charlotte, North South Carolina or wherever, well, yeah. you know, uh, in Quebec City, sometimes that, I'm there too. Then that way you guys can just have spend a little time together and then yeah. come back. And it's just, it's not so daunting. If she can meet you at the end of the leg of a trip yeah, and then you guys can spend some time together. I mean, you guys have got one hell of a system though. I can just imagine just, I tell you what. I love you, but I tell you, meet me at the end of the trip, and then we'll spend a weekend together, and then we'll come back. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's good, you know, uh, anybody who's listening who's married, sometimes it's good to have that little away time, you know, whether they say distance makes a heart grow fonder, and we're both very strong-willed people, very opinionated, so we love spending time with each other, and I'm sure some Sundays Cheryl's happy to drop me off at Pearson to see me go. <laughs> Probably. Just, is, the, is there a, a place that you... Is there a place within the states or wherever that you travel to that, whether it's a city or a small town or what yeah. have you, is there is there a place that you're really fond of and oh, you really definitely. enjoy going to? Yeah, I uh, on purpose took the Carolinas. I love the people of North and South Carolina. They're such good people, hardworking, down to earth. Cheryl and I, we rent a cabin every year up in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee near Sevierville, Tennessee, and. Just that whole vibe down there. It's so much different than going to New York or New Jersey or Chicago uh, or L.A. You know, that's uh, I, I'm happy down with the, the, the southern people. Uh, cooking is good. Personalities are good. And they're so friendly. Well, it seems a little more laid back there, too. Right. Like you just, yeah. They, they run at their own speed, which I think is more my speed. I know that people have said, well, if you're going to move, why don't you move to Florida? I go, 
Yeah, hurricanes, dude. I don't want to do that. <laughs> no, and I'm not knocking the people of Florida. No, but you guys get a lot more. Way, you know, your weather's a little more upside down than ours is. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I, you know, I would if that were me, I'd. Yeah, I'd be right there with you. You're just going right down to the Carolinas, and yep. like Tennessee, places like that. I mean, why not? Like I, yeah. Uh, personally, I was uh, talking to a, a guy who actually uh, designed the new logo for the Beats and Speaks podcast. He's actually he's like, sorry, things have been busy, but I'm moving. Like, because he's originally from Michigan, and um, he was like, yeah, I'm moving to Nashville next week. Uh, all right, cool. Am I going to get the logo? And thankfully, he delivered. But. You know, I mean, just the fact that he was like, yeah, I can't wait. And, you know, I'd, I'd much rather, if I was going to move anywhere, it would probably be somewhere where winter doesn't exist or, like, <laughs> right, right. like you know, one of the southern states. Um, as we wrap up here, is there anything that you can say that in your time within the business or even this year alone, what are you most proud of with Unigraph or even something in your own personal life? Yeah, Um you know, just working hard, just realizing that it doesn't come easy. And if you're persistent and you work hard and you put the time in, it will come. I've got, you know, three stepsons with uh, wives that are in different businesses and I get to coach them from time to time and mentor them. And when they go through hard patches like we have, I always say, guys, it's a fight. You get up every morning to fight. You can fight for new business. You can fight to keep the business you have. You can fight to make sure your customers are happy. You can fight to keep, you know, your home life happy. Every day, it's not a struggle. Big difference between a struggle and a fight. But you have to have that in you to get up and and be willing to put the time and the work in. It's crazy times we live in. I heard yesterday an eight-year-old made $26 million last year off of YouTube. Yeah. Testing toys or showing kids how to open toys, unwrap toys and play with them. That's not my world. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's not my world see hearing that I'm just I'm kind of thinking did I get in the wrong business like, yeah, what's going yeah. on maybe I should have just yeah. started unwrapping old toys from my childhood you know wrap them up in cellophane yeah. I don't know how many hits that would do but still, still. 26 million dollars for an 8 year old that kid's set for life yeah so um, that, that's really it you know and, and what we do is still old school we produce we raw materials go on a printing press a finished product comes out the other end and I'm proud of that. I'm really proud of that, that the printing industry is still thriving as much as ebooks were coming in, you know, years ago and, and book sales were down. I fly so much that I see that in the airport. Now I see it on the airplane. People are going back to books. The, don't get me wrong. There's still e-readers, but people are going back to vinyl. People are going back to, you know, what's good and wholesome. And what they remember. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that I think that's what makes me proud is to be a part of this great industry. Well, Mike, I'm sure that the world and the printing industry and life in general is better with you in it. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mike Tebow. Mike, I want to thank you for joining me on the Beats and Speaks podcast. It was a real pleasure. And if you ever want to come back, there's always a spot available for you here. We can just shoot the breeze and talk about whatever your heart desires. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Mike Tebow on the Beats and Speaks podcast. Mike, thank you once again. Thanks for having me, Lee. I appreciate it. It was a real, real pleasure to talk to Mike. If you guys want to know more about Unigraph International and what they do, go to unigraphinternational.com. All right, I have been your host, Lee Dickey, and of course, this is another episode. This wraps up another episode of the Beats and Space Podcast. We will see you all and talk to you all next Friday at midnight Eastern time for a brand new episode of the Beats and Space Podcast. I am signing off. Peace. Well, there it is. There you have it. There you go. My interview with the co-owner and vice president of Unigraph International, Mike Tebow. Mike, thank you once again for coming on the Beats and Speaks podcast. It was a real pleasure to get to talk to you about the history of Unigraph International, how the company started, how you got started, and just have a good old-fashioned conversation and good time. It was a real, real pleasure. Thank you, good sir. And if you'd ever want to come back and do another one, there's always a spot available for you here and you are always welcome to get in touch with Mike Tebow and Unigraph International. Please go to unigraphinternational.com. All that information is in the description down below. But this wraps up another episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. Of course, I have been your host, Lee Dickey. To get in touch with me to be a guest and just to drop a line, Shoot me an email at leetdickey at gmail.com. Find the Beats and Speaks podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, my official website, leetdickey.com, and wherever 
podcasts are available. Please do rate and leave us five-star reviews on your favorite podcast app and player of choice as that helps us climb in the rankings, which means we get to produce more episodes and more content for you all. But thank you all once again. Find us on YouTube as well under Lee Dickey TV. Of course, all that information is in the description down below. But I have been your host, Lee Dickey. This has been another episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. Remember to get in touch with Mike Tebow and Unigraph International. Go to unigraphinternational.com. But I am signing off, and we will see you all and talk to you all next Friday at midnight Eastern time for a brand new episode of the Beats and Speaks podcast. I've been Lee Dickey, and we'll talk to you all next week. Have a good one. See you soon. Peace. dickie.com